Our scripture reading for this afternoon will be from Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. Matthew chapter 6, 5 through 15. And when you pray... You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you that they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses." The text for this afternoon comes from the Word of God as summarized in Lord's Day 45 in the Heidelberg Catechism. If you would like to follow along, Lord's Day 45 is found on page 559 in the Book of Praise. 559. Why is prayer necessary for Christians? Because prayer is the most important part of the thankfulness which God requires of us. Moreover, God will give his grace and the Holy Spirit only to those who constantly and with heartfelt longing ask him for these gifts and thank him for them. What belongs to a prayer which pleases God and is heard by him? First, we must from the heart call upon the one true God only, who has revealed himself in his word for all that he has commanded us to pray. Second, we must thoroughly know our need and misery so that we may humble ourselves before God. Third, we must rest on this firm foundation that although we do not deserve it, God will certainly hear our prayer for the sake of Christ our Lord, as he has promised us in his word. What has God commanded us to ask of him? Answer all the things we need for body and soul, as included in the prayer which Christ our Lord himself taught us. What is the Lord's prayer? Answer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, when it comes to prayer, the vast majority of us have a fair understanding about what prayer is and how it works. Many of us grew up with this great blessing where we had parents teach us how to pray. And the importance 
of building this relationship with God. Prayer is wonderful. In prayer, we worship God. We commune with the creator of the heavens and the earth. But even though many of us have this understanding of what prayer is, what would be your response if you were asked, what does prayer look like for you? Would you feel guilty or disappointed? Would you answer maybe saying something along the lines of, well, I do pray, but I wish I could pray more. And often when I do pray, it can sometimes feel robotic or mechanical or awkward or unnatural or something like that. It is a common problem many believers face if you answered yes to something along those lines. When it comes to individual prayer, it does not have to be awkward. It does not have to be boring or too routine. Instead, our prayer life can become deeply transformative, uplifting, and meaningful in our day-to-day lives. It is through an active and living prayer life that we are really rooted and built up and connected to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, this afternoon, we are going to look at this concept of prayer under the following theme and points. The Lord Jesus teaches his followers about prayer. We're going to look at why we are to pray, how we are to pray, and what we are to pray. So our first point, why we are to pray. Have you ever wondered, why do we pray? We, we may ask, uh, since God knows everything, he knows our thoughts, he knows our needs, and he knows when to give us things when we need it. Well, why do we really need to pray then? Well, in God's word, we are given an answer. In scripture, we are provided with two major reasons as to why we are to pray. The first reason simply is God commands us. And the second is we desperately need it. So the first, God commands us. This should be relatively simple to understand. In God's word, our Lord expects his people to call out to him. We see this reality in Psalm 50, verse 15, for example, which says, And call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. God wants his people to cry out to him in prayer with a heartfelt longing. When you're in trouble, when misery surrounds you, when you feel like you are drowning in your current situation, Call out to God, for he alone promises to deliver you. However, we should not only pray to God when we are in trouble. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, Paul writes this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Paul instructs Christians to rejoice, to pray unendingly, and to give thanks in all circumstances. To rejoice is to have this deep rooted internal joy rather than an outward emotional kind of joy. See, emotional happiness can be taken away from us in an instant. One wrong comment from somebody, one bad accident, one bad diagnosis can take away our emotional happiness. But if our joy is ultimately found in Christ, then we can have this internal joy, this internal attitude where we trust in God that he is working everything for good. Nothing is outside his will. When we trust God, when we have this peace, having this faith in God will enable us to give thanks to God in all circumstances because ultimately this is his will. That is why it's so humbling yet comforting that we can pray, thy will be done. Because when we pray that, what we are really confessing is what happens in our life is not ultimately up to sinful people, 
or a fallen world or to us, but a gracious God who loves us dearly. The last thing that should be noted under this idea that God commands prayer is that Jesus tells his followers to do it. In Matthew chapter 7, 7 through 8, Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. There is a sense in what Jesus is teaching us here is that we will not obtain blessings or these good things from God unless we ask ask them of him in prayer. What Jesus desires of the people who follow him is that they lean on God for everything. Yes, of course, the major things in life, the big calamities or serious issues of our times, we go to God and we pray. But we should desire to go to God outside these moments as well. Why not pray when we are just going for a walk, when we are beginning our work? God loves you and wants to bless you in this spiritual growth, which will not grow unless you go to God in prayer. The second reason that we pray is because we really need it. In Psalm 103, the psalmist exalts the Lord, saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The example presented before us here in the psalm is to give thanks to the Lord. Prayer is said to be in the catechism the most important part of our thankfulness because in thanking God, we reflect on three things primarily. We're reflecting on one, answered prayer, two, God himself, and three, our deliverance. So one, answered prayer. When we bless the Lord, not forgetting all his benefits, we thank God for the prayers that he has answered in our lives, which means that it is really hard to be thankful for answered prayer if we never actually pray. If you want to see your life changed by prayer, where you look to God with awe, with true inward thankfulness, you need to pray. The second reason that we pray, or another reason that we're thankful in prayer, is because of God himself. When we bless the holy name of the Lord, we are thanking God for who he is. To thank God in prayer, we need to know who God is. If we don't really know who God is, then we can't thank him appropriately. Therefore, if you want to meaningfully thank God, then we need to know what he has said about himself in his word. Simply put, if you want to have a deep prayer life, you will not have a shallow view of God. Either before or after you pray, read your Bible, study our God, and then pray. Make it your mission to praise God like the psalmist who blesses our Lord with his soul and all that is in him. In three, we are to thank God also for his deliverance, for our deliverance. When we live and walk the Christian faith, we all have a tendency to wander away from the God who saves us. We sometimes can either fall into this trap where we are either legalistic or too against the law. When we are too legalistic, trying to follow every law, every rule, what will happen is we will often either become extraordinarily prideful or extraordinarily depressed. We will either become prideful in thinking 
that we are better than others or we will become depressed. We will feel like we are working so hard, we're trying so hard to follow God, but we just keep failing. Then there are those of us that just take the grace of God for granted. There is no care or concern for living the Christian life. There is a sort of spiritual laziness that is present in our hearts. People like this take repentance as a a single event, as if our ticket has been punched and now we can just wait sitting on our hands, something like that. The cure, the cure for both of these abuses of the law of God have the same answer. That is in our prayers of thankfulness. In our prayers, when we reflect on how God has worked in our lives, when we reflect back on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and really understand that he has completely saved us from the beginning to the end, then we will not be prideful in our own works. Because we will know that they do not add anything to our salvation. Instead, we will do good works because we are truly thankful to God. Likewise, we will not be lazy when we approach our faith either. In prayer, when we reflect on Jesus who saves us from our sins, those prayers will change us and make us more willing to daily pick up our own crosses and follow after Jesus. Not because it saves us, but because we love him. Point number two, how we are to pray. When we realize how important prayer is, we will desire to do it more. But how are we to pray? And this question of, is, of course, answered by Jesus, who teaches his disciples this wonderful prayer in Matthew 6, saying, Pray like this then, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The first thing that we note from this prayer is who it is addressed to. We are to pray to our Father in heaven. Jesus' instruction is to pray to our Holy Father, our God, directly. We're not to pray to saints or by the prophets or by the kings of Israel, but we are to go directly to God in our prayers. When we talk about this word, how, we often use that word when we are speaking about attitudes. We might say to one another, how have you been? Or how are you doing? Something along those lines. And you might respond, oh, I am doing well. I I got a promotion at work or you know what, things, I, I'm really down, to be honest. I, uh, that's just how it is. What then, should it be, what then should be our attitude when we approach God in our prayer time? In 2 Chronicles 7.14, God speaks and he says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven and and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Many of us understand how humbling it is to ask somebody for help. When we ask for help, what we're really saying to that person, I need you. I can't do this by myself. That is why in prayer, God wants us to come before him in humility. Our deliverance only comes at the hands of God, not men. Therefore, when we stop acknowledging our sin or stop acknowledging our blessings that God has given us or our great salvation that is found in Jesus, that is when we begin to lose our attitude of humility and thankfulness. We will turn more inward and become prideful in our actions. When we look at the prayer Jesus teaches his followers, we pray for God's kingdom to come and his will be done. Praying these things earnestly, praying this and actually meaning what you are praying is humbling. 
It is humbling because we acknowledge in prayer that this world is not our kingdom, not about my will, my desires triumphing, but God's will triumphing. In short, to remain humble is to remain in prayer. One of the last things the catechism notes in question and answer 116 is that God will certainly hear our prayers. When we approach God in prayer, do we have a trust or assurance that he will hear us? In John 14, 13 through 14, Jesus says, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. We can ask anything in Jesus' name. Jesus is our mediator, our great high priest that came to earth for our benefit. Jesus hears all our prayers. Therefore, along with this attitude of humility, let us not forget that when we pray, we are also approaching God in faith. In Hebrews 10.22, it says, Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We are to draw near to God sincerely. We do not make a mockery out of our personal time with God. We pray to him in faith that he hears our prayers with assurance that comes from Christ's saving work. God hears our prayers in every area of our life. And we turn to God in prayer because through Jesus, we are guaranteed help in any and every situation. We turn to God in prayer because as Christians, we love Jesus. Through Christ's work, we have been delivered from Satan. We have peace with God, whom we can rely on for all things. Fellowship is restored. Our relationship is restored. Our lives are restored through Christ. If that makes you thankful, and it should, our response should be one of thankful prayer. I'll finish this point with this quote from Jerry Bridges, who writes this. Your worst days, your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace. And your best days, your best days are never so good that you are beyond the need of God's grace. Our last point, point number three, what we are to pray. The last thing we will consider today is what we should pray for. And this should be easy to understand because really we should pray for everything for all things body and soul, as the Catechism says. Now again, the foundation to understand what we are to pray goes back to Jesus. Are you seeing this common trend? Our, our prayer life is molded by Jesus, made possible by Jesus, and made so that we may have a deep and loving relationship with Jesus. In Matthew chapter 6, 9 through 13, Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. And when we, when we look at the petitions that we are to pray for, such as forgive us our debts or give us our daily bread, lead us not into temptation and so on, these things that we petition God for in prayer encapsulates everything we need. In the Lord's prayer, we bless and reflect on the holiness of God. We thank God for who he is, what he has done, which is delivering us from our sins. And we pray for what he will do when we say that God's will be done. We pray for all things, for body and soul, and that even our day-to-day -day needs, the food that we eat, we also pray for. In Philippians 4, 4 through, uh, in Philippians 4, chapter 4, 6 through 7, Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God 
and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. With thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. When we request everything needed for body and soul, we are worshiping God as we request protection from catastrophe, from turmoil, and from hunger. We pray trusting that God will supply us with everything we need so that he will be glorified. Sometimes we may wonder, can I really bring this before God? Or, or we may question, if God really cares, if I make this small decision here or that small decision there. But when we have this attitude where we look to God, not only when it comes to, when it, uh, sorry, we, when we have an attitude where we look to God, not only when it comes to the big things in our lives, but also the small things, we will live a life where we experience God in the day-to-day, -day, not just the Sunday. When we make it our mission to pursue God, to pray and to read and to follow Christ, not out of obligation, but out of reverence and love, that's when our lives are transformed. As we are being conformed more and more to be like Jesus. To some extent, this old saying has a ring of truth to it. Whatever is not done in prayer is done in pride. The final point we want to make this afternoon is from Matthew chapter 6. Before Jesus gives his disciples this famous Lord's Prayer, he warns his listeners. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 6, saying, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you that they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. One of the warnings Jesus tells us about here is not to pray like the hypocrites. So what were they doing that was hypocritical? according to Jesus. Well, the Pharisees, or uh, these religious authorities, prayed to God in public, which was not the problem. The problem with the Pharisees was their motive. The Pharisees prayed to God, but their desire was to be seen by men. They wanted to be seen as these godly people. They wanted this prestigious status as holy men. The problem with the Pharisees was not because they did not believe in God. They were not atheists after all. The problem that Jesus was exposing of these people was that they treasured something more than God himself. When we hear the word hypocrite, especially in a church context, we tend to immediately jump to the Pharisees. And that's fair. After all, Jesus critiques them a lot. And he's critiquing them here in this passage. But all of us can become religious hypocrites when we pray to God, yet treasure something else as greater than who we claim to worship. What we treasure will shape how we pray. If the only time we go to God in prayer is in times of turmoil, that can be evidence that our treasure is something other than God. In other words, the thing we value most in life, when that thing is threatened, and that is the only time we're going to God in prayer, and then in that instance, we are not coming to God in humility or thankfulness or true faith. We are coming to God to get something out of him. And this can happen to all of us. When things are going bad, we cry out to God. We spend day after day, night after night in this deep, devout prayer. But what happens? Uh, things start going good. Our life gets easier and our prayer life disappears. When we are in this type of prayer, when we're in this type of routine where we're only crying out to God when things really get bad in our lives, we run a serious risk of being hypocrites. 
we're not really worshiping in faith, but praying like hypocrites. Proverbs 4.23 says this, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the, the springs of life. In Scripture, the heart is the innermost center of the human person. True prayer must come from the heart that loves and desires Jesus. In Matthew 5, 8, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. When we have Jesus as our ultimate treasure, our faith is impossible to shake. Because despite tribulation or sword, we can rejoice knowing that our treasure is secured. Through heartfelt prayer, we have this relationship with Jesus the Jesus who never changes, the Jesus who has victory over life and death, the Jesus who loves you and continually intercedes on your behalf is calling. Prayer at times may not feel natural because naturally we are alienated from God, but with humility and with heartfelt longing, we can pray to God might look something like this. Lord of the heavens and the earth, my heart is hard and I do not desire you like I should. I do not revere you as I should. Lord, soften my heart to hear your words. Soften my heart so I may see you as my greatest treasure. In that moment, (coughs) in that moment, We are going to God in sincerity and humility. And we are crying out in faith with a hope that he will answer us. And he will answer you. He will change you. And most importantly, he will love you. Amen.